Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. And today we're painting the hadrosaurus that we had painted last time around. And let's see here. So I'm, I'm looking at my stuff off, off screen and my... There, my th these are... They're um, Corythosauruses. Um, the uh, name comes from their... their um, heads that look like Corinthian helmets, or um, they also look like cassowaries. If you've seen a cassowary, it's a helmeted bird from, I believe, Australia. Um, if it's not from Australia, it's from New Zealand. I would have to double check that. I don't have it directly in front of me, and now that I'm going, wait a second, cassowaries, I think they're Australia. Um, but anyways, they're a uh, pretty helmeted bird. They kind of look like an emu, but they even have a, a bigger helmet on their head. And um, the color that we're going to paint these guys today, we're going to use raw sienna, um, some Payne's Gray, one of my favorite colors. I love Payne's Gray for various things. We're going to paint these babies pretty fast, I think, today. And so what I might do is after we're done uh, painting them, um, I'll also go over the pen and ink again. And we're going to start with the sky. This is a Prussian blue, um, another one of my favorite colors. One of the reasons why I like, I say, Prussian blue over ultramarine or um, cobalt blue, which are the other two blues. I have a tendency, there are three blues I like to use. I like to use cobalt Prussian and ultramarine. Um, Prussian is a very turquoise blue. It's got more green in it or more yellow. Um, cobalt blue is uh, a little bit, again, slightly to the green sign, but it's got a lot of pigment in it. And the Prussian blue, I'm going to dot that. It's The sky's a little bit heavy right now, so I'm going to go in with my paper towel and I'm going to blot the sky away and you get see it also gives a little bit of texture so kind of you, you get a feeling of um, clouds there and I'm painting uh, the background here where I'm going to be putting in some green so it's like it's gonna look, look more like foliage behind this particular dinosaur but I'm covering the the blue over it and then I will paint the green over that blue um, just to give it some layering so I don't have to worry about that bloom being under there. And to give it a little bit more mottled sky, I'm going to do a little bit of stippling in the sky right now around the helmet. That'll give a little bit more interest to that area. So along with my, my blotting it, it'll give it some interest. And again, this has gotten a little bit heavy. Now, here's the problem with watercolor. It goes down dark, and as it dries, it dries lighter. So it's very difficult to determine, you know, how dark this is going to be. So I think I might just leave that. And depending on your color, um, it, it'll d dry in different fashions. And I'm going to take a little more of the Prussian blue, and I'm going to throw it down here. Even though this is going to be all plants, I'm going to throw a little bit of blue down in here because what will happen was, is that particular blue will come through the plants and it'll be similar to the sky, so it'll give it a little bit more of a harmonizing effect when the entire painting's done. And that's the fun thing with watercolor is I really feel that the paint um, creates a quality that it paints itself sometimes. And if you um, paint small like this, this is three by three inches, you can paint quickly and it allows you to both make mistakes and learn from them very fast. So if you, you make any kind of mistake and you've, you've done a small painting, you haven't wasted a lot of time on that particular painting and you can use your mistakes to help you decide what you want to do in another painting. And the, the other thing is, is what's really nice about watercolor as well is as you're making mistakes, those mistakes actually might be more to your advantage than your disadvantage. Okay. That's the Prussian blue that I'm laying down there. The next color I'm going to use is raw sienna. Um, raw sienna is an interesting color. You can see it's a yellow. Um, 
when you're using this color, another there are several colors that you could use that are similar to raw sienna. Um, yellow oxide is very similar to raw sienna. Sienna, um, yellow ochre is very similar to raw sienna. Either one of those you could use in, in instead of this particular paint. And it all depends on what you really want out of it. This is more of a, a brown yellow. So rather than mixing up a lot of uh, mixing yellow with some um, different colors to get a more of a brown yellow, um, I like to use a raw sienna. What's real interesting is burnt sienna is almost um, a, a red color. It's a red brown, whereas raw sienna is a very yellow brown. So the thing is, is if you get the two tubes of paint and you compare the two of them, I like to use raw sienna a lot for um, underneath shadows. Right now we're going to use it, they're on a kind of a, a sandy type of ground. So I'm using yellow. And then the dinosaurs themselves, when we get into them, I'm going to do the dinosaurs a little bit gray and then give them some um, yellow markings. So. As I'm going again, here are these plants in here. I'm not worried about them because again, I'm using this raw sienna that is um, more or less a yellow. So as I go over the blue, you can see how the plants are going green because you know, the standard when you mix yellow and blue together, you get green. And you know, I'm not going to take it for granted that everybody learns that in art school or grade school or when when you've um, you know. If you've never painted before, this is a transparent medium. So your standard colors, primary colors are blue, red, and yellow. And when you mix any of those two colors together, um, you'll get a third color. So we've got our two primary colors here are, we've got a blue and we've got a yellow. And so the third color that's coming out is a green. And so it's like you can see I'm getting a little bit of green in there along with my yellows and my blues. And I'm not like totally going over the blues because like I said, I want a little bit of that blue sparkle to come through. And I'll probably, if it's not enough coming through, I'll come back and get some more um, when we get done with the painting of the background. So it's like you can tell I'm painting all over this little painting. And then it goes the same way when I'm doing larger painting as, w as well because you want to get... Um, the entire pain, painting to harmonize with it in the colors. So it's like you want certain things to stand out. So like the subjects are going to definitely stand out. The, the um, dinosaurs themselves will stand out just because of the subject matter, the fact that you've got eyeballs on them and your eye is always drawn to any dot or anything that looks like an eye first. Um, the way the composition's set up. Those are all things that will take you to the dinosaurs kind of first and then the background is just that it's the harmonizing thing behind them okay so we've got our initial background color set up here and again I've only used two colors thus far we've used Prussian blue and raw sienna now I'm gonna go in on our dinos this is Payne's gray um, Payne's gray is a beautiful premixed color that I really love. It's a blue gray and it's very transparent and it also it has actually a lot of pigment in it. Um, it doesn't lay down the pigment though but it picks up very easily. So it, it will mix in with the other colors in interesting ways. Payne's gray always comes out really really interesting colors after the fact. So it's, it's one of the reasons why I like that it's got um, kind of a purpley blue note to it, as it were. It's, it's a very unique color, and um, I like to use it for shadows. I like to use it as, as a color in itself. And we've got, um, basically, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, these dinosaurs would be like, you know, elephants. They, um, the hadrosaurs were vegetarians. They found a lot of um, plant fiber in their stomachs. So what's really cool is if you read up on um, uh, all the duck-billed dinosaurs, uh, a lot of them came from uh, the United States, a lot of them were in 
Um, they found in China, they found some, in, um, like the iguanodonts they found in Europe. Um, but the thing is, is that these, these are basically your herd animals um, that would eat lots of plants. So there would be, you know, you know, when um, um, paleo artists are uh, reconstructing these animals, a lot of times they think in terms of what type of environment were they in, what kind of animal, what kind of things that did they eat, um, what type of um, uh, niche do they hold that is similar to animals that would be in our current niche. So the thing is, is that these, you know, if they were big herd animals, they might be more brown. Or if you think that they might um, live in, um, there wasn't really grasslands. They were starting to have grasses, but most of the uh, plants, um, this is during the late Cretaceous, would be um, more like your horsetails, conifers, things of that nature. And um, they would uh, eat stones like birds would. Um, I know some of the, the dinosaurs would have um, stones in their gut and they would um, use those to grind up their food too because most of them, they, they chomp off the leaves and then, um, or chomp off things and just, it would go to their gut and ferment and they would um, basically get their, their nourishment from the things that were ferment, fermenting in their gut. Okay, now you can tell this dinosaur here, if you can see there's a little bit of a sheen over this dinosaur, so he's pretty wet still. I want to be painting on this one because the the paper has dried a bit, so I won't have as much foxing in it. And I'm going to go into him with a little bit of um, uh, I'm going to go in with a little bit of burnt umber, and burnt umber is going to have again, it's going to be go red. It's not going to be as red as a sienna. Whereas, um, if I went in with a, a burnt sienna, it, the, the shadow here would go very warm. And what I'm trying to do is get a bit of a shadow using a brown and a warm brown. So I'm actually using um, burnt umber, which is a more of a yellow brown. Um, the raw umber is um, actually more of, again, even yellower brown than that. Um, that's why raw sienna looks yellow, but um, raw umber looks almost um, olivey. Has kind of a green hue to the brown, whereas raw umber is is brown with a bit of yellow in it. So I want a little bit of a warmth in my shadow here. So I'm putting this using the uh, the raw umber as my initial shadow. Now this might not be my final shadow. I haven't decided yet. Um, most likely, hmm, I'm still trying to bake because I want to kind of kick things to the blue side. And what I'm doing here too is when I paint, um, I don't make all my decisions immediately while, you know, before I start painting. I knew I wanted to make the hadrosaurs or the, the um, uh gray or to the gray side like an elephant. But I'm, I'm going to put some markings on them, too. And, but I didn't decide yet, you know, whether I wanted the shadows warm or cool. And that's something that you can decide after the fact. While you're, while you're working and you're harmonizing your colors and you're pulling everything together, am I going to make this composition more warm or am I going to make it more cool? And if I want to make it more cool, am I going to contrast it by putting some purple shadows in there? And I think I'm going to... I'm, Right now, I'm, I'm leaning towards keeping it to the warm side. So it's like I'm putting this again, just having up the paint itself. It's still the same paint. This is still um, burnt umber, but I'm making burnt umber shadows on these like yellow rocks. And all I'm doing is laying a little bit more pigment down with less water. This particular technique that I'm using is usually known as um, uh, dry on dry because my brush is not terribly wet. It does have the watercolor does have some water in it because I couldn't paint it but didn't have any water at all in it. But it's pretty it's a pretty dry brush. I'm not putting a lot of uh, water into my paint 
and it's more or less I'm, I'm keeping the paint pretty dry on a very dry surface and I find that when I do that I am able to control things better it doesn't mean you are going to be able to control things better it's just one way to control things better um, this particular paper is um, Canson 300 pound or no sorry 300 gram or 150 pound cold press so it's got a little bit of what's called tooth it's got a little bit of a grain to it but not a lot of grain if you want a very grainy paper you'll get rough it's literally called rough and that's that's I I don't think I have painted on rough paper in years I have a tendency to use either hot press which is very smooth or I use this as cold press and that like I said it gives a little bit of a tooth a little bit of a texture okay that's looking pretty good I am going to now um, put a little bit more green into the foliage I'm going to use a little bit of permanent green light mixed in with just a touch of um, Prussian blue so I'm, I'm taking uh, permanent green light is um, a yellow green it's a medium value yellow green and I'm gonna throw just a little bit of a blue into it to, to heavy up the, uh, the plants here and I'm gonna stipple that in we're gonna get just some little extra texture down here so it's like he's like coming out of uh, some ferns and there were lots of ferns tons of ferns in that particular era so it's it's really funny to think that uh, the grasses were just I think starting to come into existence around um, this period there weren't a lot of grasses yet most of everything were like I said they were the horsetails various kinds of horsetails um, various types of ferns conifers and the, all the big trees were conifers so if you can think of if you've never been to the sequoias go if you live on the East Coast or you live someplace else in the world before you are dead make sure you go to either Yosemite or the high Sierras and see yourself a giant redwood there is nothing like being beneath a forest of giant redwoods and imagining you know dinosaurs eating those babies and they're being everywhere it's it's kind of a neat neat thing to do when you go to that part of the world and think of the, the area filled with dinosaurs now I'm gonna give a little bit of um, of a color on the back and I think what I'm gonna do I'm gonna use a little bit of um, burnt umber again to give a little bit of striping on the back because you know I figure oh these are herd animals per se and they would be in the um, forest as well it wouldn't be so much you know it's like I've got yellow um, sandstone kind of they're on like sandstone environment here but um, they would be more forest animals but I live in Southern California and we have sandstone and forest together so you can have you can have um, yellow stones and green trees that's that's the interesting thing where I, I live we have um, a lot of uh, yellow sandstone and pine forests so that's that would be something that would be perfectly legit and like I said if you're you know if you're draw if you're drawing and painting dinosaurs you've got to think about the fact of okay what kind of environment would they be living in during that period and I've got at the the bottom of the page here um, if you're watching YouTube there is a link to the page on Wikipedia and I'm a big a fan of Wikipedia if um, you ha don't donate to them please do um, they're in they're a nonprofit and they've been around almost as long as the internet and when you need a piece of information especially when it comes to things like dinosaurs or things that are especially the non-political stuff you know just inf information um, you will find a lot of the most um, updated stuff there because the people who write Wikipedia articles like to go in and you know somebody's done a new 
dinosaur discovery or something, they will, you know, go over and, oh, gee, we got to add this to the Wikipedia page. And um, you can add to it yourself if you are knowledgeable of anything. I have utilized it. It's much better than Encyclopedia Britannica. When I was a kid, that's what we had. Or I had to, when I first started illustrating, I had to buy the most recent books on dinosaurs to find out anything that was, you know, okay, they, the information on dinosaurs is changing all the time. New theories are, you know, are coming out. I mean, it's only been in the past 10 years that we actually said, okay, these guys are birds. And the birds that we see in their, our trees are relatives or they're basically the dinosaurs did not go extinct. It's just that only the little ones survive. The great big ones, they didn't make it, but the little ones survive, and you have it when you're eating chicken at dinner at night. As I always say, thank goodness for dinosaurs, because I get to eat dinosaur embryos for breakfast. Okay. And that's about done right there. And I'm going to go over this in pen. I'm going to stop the video here, and then um, I'll do the final portion of this um, is you go over the painting in your ballpoint pen one more time to crisp up the lines. So I'm going to stop here and then I'll start it up again and we'll finish up with the ballpoint pen. Okay? I'll be right back. Hi there. This is Lynn Hunter back. Um, there are two pens we're going to be using. Um, this is, of course I put it the wrong way. This is a Zebra F301.7 millimeter. Um, I love these things. Zebra makes great fine point pen. And my other favorite to use, your good old Bic stick. This is um, your standard um, medium point black Bic stick. And when you're talking about permanence, um, I always like to think about the fact, especially since um, I'm going to start out with the... Uh, the zebra. What I'm doing, let me, let me, I'll get back to the permits, but I just wanted to tell you what I'm doing while I'm drawing here. You can see like the, this line here is very uneven. We've got some uneven pieces like here. This is very jittery um, where I've um, done the lines unsure at first. Since we put on pigment, this is a great thing to come back after you finish painting and clean up lines. So I'm going to go in like here and go over that line just a bit and darken it up and clean it up and do the same thing here and darken it up and clean it up. And the other thing is, is that what I will do too sometimes um, before, if I'm going to publish this, if I'm going to turn this into a full illustration, if there are certain areas like here's that little, there's a little bit of emptiness in that color there and that might show up when I scan it into the computer. I can go and um, um, basically I'll use a clone stamp or I'll use um, um, just a brush the same color of that paint and I'll fill that in just a little bit more. It's something that if you're you're doing a painting that is going to be um, just viewed on the wall, most people won't notice the little discrepancies like that or you know it's not that important to them. Um, if you're doing something for print, you might want to go back in and do a little bit more cleaning up after the fact. Um, just because when people um, are looking at a printed piece, number one, if I were doing this in a printed book, it'll probably go up to 8 by 8 inches, so it'll be blown up. And so um, any kind of discrepancies that I wanted to fix on detailing, I might clean those up in Photoshop. And they're not things that, you know, like I said, to the naked eye, when you're talking three by three inches, a lot of that stuff will not be seen that much. It, it'll just, there, they'll just be small um, imperfections that are just part of being a piece of art, being something that's handmade. Um, but what we're doing right now is just making things a little bit cleaner and a little bit darker. I'm thickening up the lines ever so much, which is one of the reasons why... Um, I like to go in. Usually I'll go back and forth between this pen and um, the Bic stick because the Bic, the Bic will drop the ink really fast and nice. This is a little bit, um, how shall I say, more finicky and the line is definitely finer. 
um, these, this particular dinosaur. I'm going to go in like with this leg here. I did that a little bit erratic and I want to give it a good heavy line. So I'm going to come in with this big stick. And again, with all things, it's how the pen feels to you, how you feel when you're working with the tool. Um, which is one of the things I, I still like traditional tools, um, actually a little bit more than digital, just because they still have tactile. Um, your digital tools just, they'll have feel to them, but it's its not quite the same. And I, I have to admit, I... I've grown up with years and years and years of using traditional tools, using what I call the wet stuff. Um, so obviously I'm a little bit more attuned to the non-digital tools than the digital tools. I use them both. I like them both. I like them both for different reasons. But when it comes to the Zen of art, um, for me there's nothing like working with traditional tools because you have smell um, and you have touch that is taken away the smell especially is taken away when you do digital you can smell the ballpoint pen ballpoint pen has a definite odor to it um, as well as now this this dinosaur is very very tiny so it's like that's why the 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 um, fine point comes in really handy I'm using again this is three by three inches um, if you want really detailed work, um, I will come. That's one of the reasons why I like um, traditional pen and ink and Crokewell. Oh, you can get so freaking tiny with, with those tools, just with a touch. That's the other thing, too. I, I find it fascinating how, again, people who have been using nothing but digital tools all their life, they don't realize how really sensitive your hands are to... Um, the pressure that you put on a tool and it's like with a tool like um, a Crowquill pen how you can get that thing to immediately go to, from thick to thin in in milliseconds and the same thing with with the uh, pencil so that it's one of those things where I do appreciate digital tools I do like what they can do um, geez I don't have to clean up airbrush anymore oh if you have ever airbrushed and the amount of mess airbrush makes and then you ha start using digital and how wonderful it is to use a digital tool uh, or you know just like Photoshop or any of the programs and not have to use an airbrush ugh, it's delightful um, so th like I said digital has its place but um, if you want the joy that you have with something that you can touch and feel and it um, I'm not sure because I'm not looking through the camera right now, but um, the ballpoint pen also engraves. So the thing is, is that there's there's a line that's cut into the paper when you draw with a ballpoint pen, and so it's 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 a very unique feeling that is just not like anything else. So I'm, that's why I'm still an advocate of using traditional tools as well as digital. I like them both. If you go to uh, my Instagram or my Patreon, you can see a lot of both. Um, I do my entire um, comic book is painted digitally while I do the line work in pen and ink. And again, it's a um, steampunk comic, so I wanted to give it a bit of that antique feel. So that's why I decided to do uh, the line work um, traditionally rather than, say, do, drawing the line work in the computer. And there's no reason why I couldn't have done it in the computer um, other than I really just wanted to have it give it that, that turn-of-the-century feel. Okay, we're basically finished here. And so that's Carithosaurus C, uh, watercolor. My name is Lynn Hunter. I've got all my links below. I'm on Patreon, Instagram, and uh, please like and follow me. I'm putting up a new um, video every week. It'll be just like this, something short and sweet and interesting that you can learn how to use the tools. Anyways, thank you for watching. Really appreciate your being here. Bye-bye.